So let me first of all thank the organizers, uh, Swapan and uh, Rohini, for this opportunity to uh, speak before you. And also, of course, the host ICTS for the wonderful uh, you know, ambience and so on. Okay, so I'll be uh, building on what uh, Indumati uh, has already said, uh, but uh, hoping that we will have an underground lab somewhere deeper uh, and what will we do with it. Yeah, so this is the plan of my talk, uh, some background to underground research in India, the need for an underground lab and some experiments that we have been thinking about and the future outlook. Okay, so uh, underground research started in about 51, uh, a few years after Humi Baba founded TIFR in Bangalore. And he got Professor Srikantan to begin a series of experiments in the Kolar gold fields. And that was to measure muons with the detectors that were then current at that time. So using the rock density, uh, he measured, I mean, this group measured the muon flux as a function of depth. And then that could be converted, knowing the, muon, uh, the rock density to a cosmic muon spectrum. And so these are some photographs of the deepest mine in India, the Champion Reef Mine, uh, some of the detectors that were used to measure muons. And uh, the, on the right, uh, lower right, is this uh, picture of the proton decay detector with Navamandal somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So this collaboration over the years produced the most comprehensive depth versus muon intensity curve. And as you can see, I mean, this extended over several orders of magnitude. And at some point, they hit uh, a flat, uh, I mean, uh, dependence which showed that these neutrino experiments could be done. Okay. So the first atmospheric neutrino detection was done in 65 in KGF. And uh, this is the paper. So it was a uh, TIFR, Osaka, City University, and uh, Durham collaboration. And interestingly, this paper came out on the 15th of August, or Independence Day in 65. Of course, simultaneously, uh, atmospheric neutrinos were also uh, evidence for that was found in a South African mine by Rhinez and his group. Uh, about, and that paper came out about two weeks later. Okay, so coming to more recent times, uh, a small underground lab has been uh, working uh, in uh, the Jadguda mine. Interestingly, this is a uranium mine. So one would say, okay, why are you doing underground experiments in a uranium mine? But the thing is that this uranium uh, mine has been working on uh, ore, which is just about 500 ppm, plus or minus about 100. So nobody else in the world would ever do such things. But we did not have access to uh, uranium. And so this is the only place. So Baba uh, supported this activity, so as to support the reactor program. Of course, now we have better uh, sources of uranium in the country. And also, uh, because of this nuclear agreement and so on, we can get it from elsewhere. Okay, so uh, this lab is at about 550 meter depth. You can see this here, 555 meters. Uh, the muon, uh, fast neutron, slow neutron, and gamma ray backgrounds have been measured. And uh, interestingly, an experiment has also been done by the VCC group. And this shows the group here uh, looking very happy. Uh, they've uh, actually done an experiment which contradicts their earlier result which uh, had a problem with the cosmic ray pileup and they attributed it to, to uh, fission fragment uh, Bremsstrahlung. So this was a measurement of uh, gamma rays in the energy region 25 to 80 MeV in the spontaneous fission of 252 California. So the earlier result was somewhere here and there were other groups elsewhere who had also done this. Uh, but when they went down, the muon background came down and the muon pileup, of course, reduced drastically. And so they contradicted the earlier result of the same experiment uh, by, by the same group. Okay, so this is just one example of uh, an experiment done at that place. So now I come to need for underground lab, possible experiments. Uh, many experiments which involve neutrinos, rare decays, ultra low cross section measurements are finally limited by the cosmic ray background. So this is of course uh, needed, such a lab. And some experiments of course can be done at a few hundred meters depth. Uh, some of the nuclear astrophysics experiments can be done. Uh, but some others require the largest possible depths. For instance, experiments like the you know, snow experiment, which actually measured the neutral current signal through singles measurement of neutrons. That requires that the muon flux go down uh, a lot. Uh, otherwise, you would mistake a neutron signal for actually a muon-induced uh, neutron signal. And then, of course, there are many seismic measurements that also require deep sites to reduce noise. Indeed, 
there is also a gravitational wave detector being built by the Japanese in an underground site called Kagra. So there are many possibilities once you go underground. I don't know whether this is, ah, yeah, it has, there's a big delay, yeah. Uh, the experiments, so there was an uh, expression of interest meeting uh, about um, three months ago in TIFR, where various groups were called. Of course, not all uh, groups could come at that time. So I will talk about some things that uh, those groups actually did, were not able to make it in that meeting. Uh, so broadly, these experiments involved neutrinos, dark matter searches, nuclear astrophysics, rare nuclear decays, and geophysics. Uh, again, maybe in future, we will also get the biologists on board because some experiments of that sort also can be done. So the experiments involving neutrinos, of course, you have heard about the 51 Nikel detector uh, for INO, what, uh, what, are the, what are the physics that it can do. Uh, I will also say a little bit about solar and supernova neutrinos that can be done. It's something that we have been working on uh, starting about a year ago on a one kiloton deuterated liquid scintillator. The uh, neutrinoless double beta decay, I think Mandana just alluded to because she was also talking about other kinds of detectors. Uh, in 124 tin, the, the, that's an ongoing R&D. Uh, dark matter research using both cryogenic cesium iodide and then cryogenic silicon, uh, superheated liquid, uh, and so on. I will not talk about that. So the ones in blue, I will say a little more about. Uh, nuclear astrophysics, so there's, so there's a group uh, formed uh, involving universities, IITs, and some of the research institutions. Uh, who want to put together a low energy accelerator of the order of 5 million volts, single ended underground, and also develop a gas, supersonic gas jet target, because these things uh, involve very high beam currents, and also a recoil mass separator. Uh, all these things are some things which the low energy nuclear physics community is quite familiar with. So these are things that are not terribly unknown, but they do require some developments like this gas jet target and so on. Okay, then there are also proposals to measure rare nuclear decays, forbidden decays, and so on. Uh, also, uh, because of these other experiments, which involve uh, you know, very rare events, you also require a low background lab. This is something that Vandana already talked about, and such a thing should be there in an underground lab as well. And then there are geophysics experiments, which involve seismic measurements, gravimetric measurements, geomagnetic, and radiogenic experiments. So the ones in blue I will talk about little more. Okay, so this is something uh, that we want to do, uh, and this would require a deep underground lab. Uh, I don't know whether I've skipped uh, a slide. The need, wait a minute. There's some slide which, yeah, okay. So, okay, well, so we, we for some experiments, as I said, we require a two kilometer uh, rock over bed. Okay, so this uh, low energy neutrino detector would involve a deuterated liquid scintillator. This is, of course, inspired by the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory uh, experiment, which is a seminal experiment. And uh, that used one kiloton of uh, heavy water loaned for $1 by uh, the company that makes this uh, heavy water. Uh, and they measured the solar neutrinos and solved the solar neutrino problem in a beautiful manner. Now, what they did is to look at the Cherenkov light. And for the neutral current signal, of course, they had various phases. And the last phase involved putting helium-3 counters to measure in singles the neutrons that are produced as a result of neutral current interactions. But the threshold for the neutrinos was of the order of 5 eV. Note that. This is also roughly the threshold that is there in the super K experiment, the 50 kiloton water Cherenkov experiment. Uh, a deuterated liquid scintillator, just because the light output is much, much more than in Cherenkov, uh, would have a much lower threshold possibly 100 or few hundreds of KeV. So that would lower that very, uh, very much. And the other thing about the deuteron is because it's a loosely bound proton neutron system, it can measure through the charge current interaction, both neutrinos and antineutrinos of the electron type, essentially, because this is a low energy detector that we want to build. So these are the reactions that are involved, uh, the neutrino and the antineutrinos of the charge current. These are the uh, thresholds, energy thresholds. And as you can see, the uh, neutral current uh, is again, uh, you can do it for any kind of neutrino, nu E, nu mu, nu tau. And uh, the threshold is of course the binding energy of the neutron. And uh, you can of course measure also elastic scattering uh, on the electron, but also elastic scattering from the other kinds of neutrinos. So this is a very versatile kind of neutrino detector. 
because of the fact that it has neutrons and protons and electrons, where you can determine the elastic scattering. Okay, so what science can a one kiloton uh, uh, DLS stands for deuterated liquid scintillator do, detector do? So one of the things that it can do, for instance, is to measure the survival probability of the electron neutrino over a large span of energy. Now, what has been done by Borexino is in this region below about one MeV using the seven beryllium neutrinos and at the higher energies of the order of uh, four uh, MeV or so, uh, uh, sorry, uh, five MeV or so, five MeV and higher. So the average energy is about eight MeV or so uh, by snow as well as super coming event. Now what such a detector could do just in one year, this is an estimate, uh, is that it could put a point here. And in fact, with more data, you could actually fill up that uh, intermediate space. Now that would enable you to distinguish between the so-called uh, MSW paradigm, which is the currently accepted uh, uh, way you analyze things for solar neutrinos, but also uh, uh, distinguish between other non-standard interaction theories beyond standard model theories. The other thing that this could do is that it could measure the day-night effect. This has been measured to one to two sigma level by snow and also by uh, super Kamiokande because they're actually looking at the tail end of the neutrino spectrum. If you can measure it for lower energies, and in fact, for the whole spectrum, uh, we, can, we think we can do it uh, uh, much better. Of course, how it started was uh, we looked at the possibility of using such a kiloton DLS for supernova neutrinos. So this is, this is the reference for that. Uh, we could look at supernova neutrinos and anti-neutrinos, and those in, from supernova are typically 10 MeV and higher. Uh, this is a very good detector for that. We can, of course, uh, signal the appearance of the supernova like other detectors. So it, we could contribute to the supernova watch. We could uh, help in the multi-messenger astronomy. And uh, as uh, Amol and uh, uh, Das Gupta have shown, that you can also uh, infer the mass ordering and uh, new, new interaction signatures. Now, why DLS? Because India is best place to do that. We are the largest producer of heavy water in the world because we have heavy water-based reactors, nuclear reactors that produce power. In fact, uh, about I think it was about a year ago or a little more than a year perhaps that the government approved the construction in a caravan mode of 10 700 megawatt heavy water-based reactors. So the heavy water board has the capability to support that activity. And each uh, reactor, needs about 500 tons of heavy water. So they, they are geared up for 5,000 tons. What we require is about one kiloton. So they, they are not terribly perturbed by this figure of, we, when we asked them, we said, okay, can you do something like a few hundred tons? Uh, so they said, no, no, there's no problem at all. Then we said one kiloton, yeah, we could do it. So I think they have the capability of, uh, you know, delivering this kind of, this amount of uh, heavy hydrogen. Now, of course, uh, they can do it, but they, I mean, they can, it can get you the source of deuterium, but of course, there are a lot of R&D is required to be carried out and particularly in BRC to convert this into the detector that you want. So on a small level of a few liters or maybe a few hundred liters or a few tens of liters, it has to be done in BRC. And then they can take over because they have the manufacturing capability. Now the immediate goal we have, uh, ideally it would have been good to have a completely deuterated liquid scintillator, but that appears to be challenging. So what we thought is we'll first start out with a heavy water soluble liquid scintillator. There is already R&D going on. And uh, so you can have something like, I mean, this is not, this is just a, a rough figure. Uh, so let's say 95% uh, deuterium uh, uh, heavy water with a 5% of hydrogen based linear alkyl benzene, which is this main scintillator. And so of course the threshold will not be 100 keV, it will be about an MeV. But that's okay, you still are improving on the earlier threshold. So uh, this, there are two groups have been formed looking at the science case as well as uh, the, a group trying to develop this water soluble uh, liquid scintillator, deuterated liquid scintillator. Okay, now I come to another, how many minutes do I have? Five, okay. So uh, this is related to a, uh, this is a possibly a futuristic uh, thing that, that in such an underground lab, one could also have another kind of detector, a indium detector, this has been for solar neutrinos. This has been proposed by Raghavan way back in 1976. Uh, and he even did, uh, I mean, they, they, there is a group formed called the Lens Group. And the final thing that they said is that they would like to build a 8% indium loaded uh, 125 ton lipid scintillator with a photon lattice. And a prototype of that is there actually built by Virginia Tech and uh, placed in a mine nearby, the Kimbleton mine. 
Now, this kind of segmentation is required because indium is actually a radioactive nucleus. It has a long half-life, but you require to reduce the random coincident background by a huge amount, by 10 to the 11 or so. And that is what is uh, that is why it is necessary to do this. Booth explored the possibility of measuring quasi-particles in the superconducting indium, but it didn't go very far, at least as far as I know. Uh, another possibility is using a cryogenic bolometer of indium metal, which would reduce the size uh, from 125 tons to just eight tons, and the uh, sorry, the size would be uh, reduced from about five meter to about one meter or so. And this could provide, apart from a real-time measurement of the uh, solar neutrinos, uh, a line measurement where there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the uh, measured spectrum and the neutrino spectrum. It could provide an independent measure of the temperature of the sun's core using the shift and broadening of the seven beryllium electron capture line, as well as the PP spectrum. Okay, so this is the transition. I will skip that. If there is a question, I can come to that. It basically involves uh, measuring the uh, electron in coincidence with the two gamma rays or a conversion electron in a gamma ray and a delayed signal. And that's how you, if you pixelize the detector. So this is the kind of spectrum which has been simulated by Raghavan. He showed it quite some time back when he came. He's no more now. Um, uh, this is the kind of spectrum that you expect from an indium loaded liquid scintillator, a beryllium seven line. Look. On the other hand, at the spectrum that you get from Borexino, which is one of the best liquid scintillators in the world. But that is a Compton-like spectrum versus the full energy spectrum that you get from an indium detector. Okay, that's the difference. So, uh, for instance, they have recently published a, a paper where they claim that, uh, I mean, I, 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 I do respect their claim, that they have measured CNO neutrinos, which are at the 1% level of the main uh, you know, solar neutrinos. And it depends on your ability to extract this red signal from this huge amount of background. So it depends on your ability to simulate and you know, uh, do various kinds of checks and uh, so on. Whereas here, you would actually just get a line spectrum. That's the beauty of this detector. Now, OK, I'll, I'll leave it at that. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. This is, again, a futuristic thing. Now, the nuclear astrophysics uh, community in India uh, has uh, come up with a proposal uh, to uh, put an accelerator underground and these are some of the cross sections that have been studied, but uh, this is just to show you that there are many cross sections where the errors are huge of the order of 60%, especially at the gamma energies, which are of interest in nuclear astrophysics calculations. Uh, because there are large extrapolations involved when you measure it at a higher energy, the cross section is large, but then you extrapolate down. And I will show you one example of a classic case. So these are some of the things that, so you need uh, cross sections at gamma energies, which are a few KV to a few hundreds of KV, depending on the charge uh, of the two uh, particles involved, the two nuclei involved, and the cross sections are very low. So it is not possible to measure them over ground. Sorry, this is the, oops, this goes really fast. Uh, I want to go back, I should wait. Right. Ah, this is the holy grail in nuclear astrophysics, namely the carbon-12 alpha-gamma cross-section. And there are many groups which want to do that. There is a group in the Jinping uh, laboratory in China, which is the deepest in the world, 2,400 meters below ground. And uh, they want to measure this using alpha beam on a carbon target. There is a German group which wants to do inverse kinematics. That is helpful in some ways because you can take a carbon-12 beam, shoot it on a gas target. And the main contributor to the background uh, which is this carbon-13 alpha n, which would be there in this approach. Uh, you see, this is the background, and this is the cross-section that you want to measure. So this will go away. But if you have a recoil mass separator, of course, this reduces very much more. So this is something that could be done. And uh, so th there is also a group which is uh, has great expertise in making, building these recoil mass separator, design and building. And uh, this, uh, they, they want to do this. So they want to use a... Uh, advanced supersonic uh, gas jet target. Uh, they want to use a uh, recoil mass separator to eliminate this background. And then they have also a very uh, nice design for this. Okay, the other things that could be done is actually measuring radon. I think I, I do, do not have expertise, but apparently this is very useful uh, in close uh, environments. This would also give you signals of uh, perhaps a, a seismic event that is about to happen and so on. So since time is short, I will skip this. Uh, there are also gravi uh, gravity, there is the acceleration due to gravity that can be measured, uh, anomalies in that. And there is this uh, Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology. So if this happens in the uh, Himalayan region, which is where you would get uh, you know, these great heights, 
then these uh, delta Gs can be measured. And, uh, oops, oh, this is terrible. I press something and then it skips, but when you want to come back, it comes slowly. Anyway, I'm near the last slide. So, for instance, they have these uh, devices which can measure an acceleration of the order of one nanometer per second squared. Imagine, so we have 10 meters per second squared. So there's 10 orders of magnitude below that, and they have sensitivities of this sort. Uh, so, I mean, they have instruments which can measure this and which will give various kinds of uh, new measurements in their view, and especially so in the Himalayan region. Okay, so the outlook is that we would like to have a tunnel-based underground lab with 1.5 kilometer rock overburden on all sides, as opposed to what we had in the earlier specification of one kilometer and two kilometer vertically, and this would make it uh, competitive worldwide. And then so possible sites are being explored given the situation in Thinney. Uh, so let me thank uh, and acknowledge all these members of the INO collaboration, NDBD, nuclear astrophysics, nuclear physics groups, uh, probably have missed out TIFR at BRC, uh, seismology uh, lab, radon lab, geomagnetism lab, and so finally, I come to the end. Thank you. Thank you. These are, by the way, pictures taken at this campus. Beautiful campus, as I said. Thank you.